Uh, but these prophets in the Bible, uh, that's why God used them and put them in. That, that's, it's all prophetic. It's, it's amazing um, how God uses his word. In verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 55, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, his thoughts is what he's thinking, and let him return unto the Lord. And notice, God will have mercy upon him. Uh, tonight I want to talk about what it means to understand God. And connected with that is understanding love. If you understand true biblical agape love, you'll understand God. Now, if your understanding of what love is, is mixed up, twisted, distorted, your understanding of God will be mixed up, twisted, and distorted. Uh, there's, there's a misunderstanding of, of God's love in our modern society. Um, we've created a love that's almost like a sugar daddy. God, he just loves you no matter what you do. You can never do anything to get God to stop loving you. And, 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 and I would say that is, um, that is, is propagating a message that is so twisted the reality of who God is. Because in the midst of God being love, true love according to 1 Corinthians 13, and what we saw this morning in James is pure. It's pure, it's holy, it's righteous. And notice this God of love. See, the God of love that we discover in 1 John where it says that God is love is the, the same God in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. So every deed that you see God perform, everything that you saw God had his people do was an act of love. You say, how could... The Israelites killing the Canaanites be an act of love. Well, it is. Hell is an act of love. People, well, I don't, it don't make sense to me. No, because the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. Because it is spiritually and spiritually discerned. So right away as God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, out of love, God is speaking. Love is speaking. When God speaks, his book is is audible. Now, this, this is revelation. This is revelation. And we need the Holy Spirit to enlighten it. I believe the very first, very first step that, that you've got to take in order for God to really truly reveal himself to you, his personality, his character, his attitude, his thoughts, his deeds, is for you to say, God, I believe everything your book says, I believe it. You just say that, I believe it. I, I, I don't understand it. And another thing is extremely important. You never put yourself in a position to judge God. You never judge God, never. You never judge whether, God, you should have done that or you shouldn't have done that. We accept it as fact. We accept the fact that he is the father of lights in whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He said, I am the Lord and I change not. So everything that God does in Genesis verse 1, chapter 1, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation is an act of holiness. It is an act of love. It is an act of righteousness, period. No if ands, or buts, period. Well, how can you do that? You accept it by faith. You accept it by faith. That's why you'll discover if you really study the scriptures and God's interreaction with the prophets of God, the holy prophets of old, you find that 99% of the time, they never argued with God in anything God told them to do. Never argued with him. Never, never. As a matter of fact, the ones who did argue with God got in big trouble. Jonah argued with God. Well, 
We know what happened to him, that he got swallowed by a, a, a large fish, and then he argued with God about the, uh, 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 the Nibonites, and he was gone. You never saw him again in the Bible. Never saw him again. Uh, if two be not agreed together, they cannot walk together. First of all, God doesn't, it's not God's responsibility to try to convince you. God is who he is. As a matter of fact, in the book of uh, Romans chapter 9, it's a very misunderstood chapter. Because it talks about, uh, it, it says in the book of uh, Romans chapter 9, it says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And a lot of people misunderstand that because really what it's talking about is vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. Well, actually, every human being deserves the wrath of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory. God's wrath is upon every human being. And yet God has vessels of mercy. Now aren't you glad you're one of God's vessels of mercy? Who are the vessels of mercy? Those who say, God, I believe what it says. And I don't have to argue it. Well, if it's God's will to be everybody to be healed, then how come everybody is not healed? I don't have to argue it. Well, if God is so much love, then how come he created hell? I don't have to argue it. I, I, don't, I don't have to argue it. I can quote scriptures if you want to believe what the scripture says. I tell you what, I've dealt with a lot of people who just call themselves Christians. I mean, these are even people who speak in tongues. And they're saying things that are contrary to the book. And you'll give them scripture after scripture after scripture, and your might as well just shut up because they've chosen to put God in the judgment seat. They're judging him. Who are you? It says there in Romans 9, who are you to judge God? Who, who am I to judge God? He is in the very center of all existing things, and he is upholding all things by the word of his power, and he, he's given a name to every star in the heaven, and, he, and he, he's counted all the grains of sand. He knows every grain of sand, every sparrow that falls, every hair on the head of his beloved. Who am I to judge God? How can I stand in a position of judging God? But we know that love is, listen, this is love speaking. And he says to the wicked, turn away from your wicked ways. Turn away from your wrong thoughts. And God will have mercy on you. Now that's the good news. That's all I need to know. That if I will acknowledge that I've disobeyed, I've gone astray, I've allowed the enemy to trick me out of the will of God, I can come home. Oh, that's good news to me. See, other people will focus on, well, well, what about those poor wicked people? It's not that God's heart don't break for them. Christ, we see, see, in, in, in my one book, uh, How God Leads in God's 20 Ways, as you read that book, the very first way that God speaks to his people, you might say it's the Bible, but it really isn't. It is, but it isn't. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus he was the brightness of his glory, the express image of his father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So Christ came to reveal the reality of the father. When you looked upon Christ, that was the father. Now, I'm not saying he was the father, but he was the manifestation of the father's will, the father's attitude, the father's heart, the father's word. And what he said is true. He talked about hell many times. He talked about eternal judgment. He talked about separation. He talked about um, being cast into outer darkness. But yet he talked about heaven. And he talked about angelic beings. And he talked about rewards. And he talked about blessings. That's God. That's love. That's love. And he says here, he will abundantly pardon. And in verse 8, he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people who will not embrace who God really is based upon his word. They won't embrace it. They just won't believe it. Because they judge God, they find fault with God, or, then, or because they cannot agree with God, that there is a punishment for the wicked and there is a reward for the righteous. That's really what it is. 
they say, well, God really didn't mean what he said. Well, that's not what the Greek says. That's not what the Hebrew says. And it's insanity. It is what God said. What God said is what he said. When he, when he told Adam and Eve, do not, and this is love. This is love. We're talking about love tonight. This is love talking. And love said to Adam in, 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 in his, his sinless condition, sinless, Adam, and he's talking to the woman and the man, do not eat of this tree. He said, he didn't say if, he said, the day you eat of that tree, if you eat of that tree, but he doesn't say if about punishment, you might be punished. So he said, if you eat of that tree, dying, you shall die in Hebrew. If you eat the fruit of that tree, if you eat it, you will die. And the soul that sinneth, it will die. He didn't say, now, Nobody else can eat that tree, but if you eat that tree, I'll forgive you, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Now, there is forgiveness, but there's, the result of it is death. And they listened to the devil and ate of the tree, and it happened exactly what he said. They died. Their eyes were opened to what? To the flesh. See, before that, their eyes were opened to nothing but the spirit. Now, being open to the spirit... That doesn't mean they didn't see the trees and the animals. No, they saw the goodness of God, the beauty of God, the awesomeness of God. Now, all of a sudden, they hear the voice of God. And notice what the sin nature does. Runs away from God. Runs away from the truth. Runs away from the light. It says there in, 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 in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, right? All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was light, and the light was the light of man. And the next verse is very powerful. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's a profound scripture. They couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't wrap their brain around it. They couldn't take a hold of it. They, it was elusive. It was, it, was, it was like a desert mirage. They, they couldn't see it. They were blind. That's why Jesus said, the blind leading the blind. The only thing that opens your eyes is trust. Believe. I believe. I believe what the Bible says. I may not feel it. I may not physically see it. I may not be experiencing it. But let God be true and everything else a lie. That is the door of faith. That, no, that's the only way into the kingdom is by faith, by trust, by reliance, by dependence upon God. And, and Jesus was trying to get people to go through that faith. He said, the reason why you can't hear what I'm telling you is because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would hear my voice. You know how many times I've tried to get goats to believe the truth, not judging their heart, but trying to get them to believe what the Bible said. And they will invite. Now, I'm talking about people who call themselves believers. So I say, well, do you acknowledge that God can't lie? Yes, yes, yes. That it's impossible for God to lie. Yes, I understand. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes, yes, yes. Well, listen what the Bible says here. Well, I don't believe it that way. Very, very confusing. God's not confused. They're confused. Because they really don't agree. They really don't believe. Why? Because they're not feeling it. They're not seeing it. They're not experiencing it. They're not touching it. They're not tasting it. Well, how does that happen? You first believe. You've got to believe. And that's why we're called believers. And so he says, look at what he says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens, and I believe the heavens is talking about is not just the atmosphere, the star, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, but I'm talking about the spiritual realm where the throne of God resides, and the angelic beings, and the sea of glass, and the cherubims, and the cherubims, and the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the rainbow, and the consuming fires of God, and the saints are gathered. It says, for as those heavens are higher than the earth, so far beyond the earth. How many know that the, the realm of heaven is not attainable by any natural means that men could ever develop? 
I don't care how intelligent man becomes. I don't care how creative he becomes. Uh, uh, his ingenuity. There's nothing that men could ever do to go from earth into that realm of the throne of God. And yet he tells his people, come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in their time of need. How do I get from earth to heaven? By faith. By faith. Faith reaches into that realm of the invisible and brings it down into the realm of flesh and blood. It does. If you understand faith in God. Confidence in God. Trust in God. Reliance in God. Ah. And he says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then he says in verse 10, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and, re and, and maketh it bring forth fruit and bud, that it may give seed to the sword, bread to the old eater, seed eater. Verse 11, he says, so shall my what? So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So then he gives us the results of what the word will do. But how is he, how are we going to come to understand God? By his prophetic word. We accept it. We embrace it. We eat it. We drink it, we think it, we sing it, we speak it, we hum it, we talk it, we walk it, we do it. Why? Faith. Faith in God. Faith in God. My daughter said to me the other day, because when she was going to uh, all-girls school college, Wilson College, she said, Dad, I went through this religious uh, class, and they're teaching all the religions of the world. She said, Dad, did you know... None of, the, none of those religions made any sense. None, none, of their, none of their prophets did any miracles, Dad. Muhammad, uh, Sun Young Moon, Buddha, Hare Krishna, name them all. None of them did miracles. None of them raised the dead, cast out devils, healed the sick. None of them died for their people. And were raised again. None of them claimed to be God in the flesh. Only Jesus. Why? Because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Well, let me shut this off. Hold on. We'll get smoked out. <laughs> if I don't. Anyways, so we, we've got to. To understand God is to understand love. How do we come up with an interpretation, a definition, an expression, the expression of love? Well, first of all, God is who he says he is. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sins. God is who he says he is. God, love sent a flood and destroyed all of every living thing on the earth in Noah's generation. That's love. Well, I don't want to serve a God like that. Okay, don't. Because there is no other God. Love did that. Matter of fact, I think the book of Jude, I memorized the book of Jude many years ago, but if you study the book of Jude, he says, listen, if the angels lost their first estate because they rebelled against God, what makes you think that as a human you can rebel against God and not be in trouble? But the doctrine of today is saying, doesn't matter how you live, how you talk, how you walk, how you act, how you treat everybody else. doesn't matter if you don't go to church, you don't pray, you don't give. It doesn't matter. Well, who, 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 who do you think is telling us that? Demonic powers. 
demonic powers even that told Eve, God doesn't mean what he says. He, he just doesn't want you to attain what he has. And, and, and if you eat of that fruit, you won't die. And the minute she accepted that lie, as a matter of fact, Paul said, I am afraid. I am afraid lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtilities, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. So we see here in Isaiah 55, that God, as he always has done from the very beginning, is trying to bring people back to a place of agreement with him. You see, God's not going to change. Yes, God became a man, and he was manifested in sinful flesh, but listen to this, he never sinned. For in other words, God's love did not cause him to compromise his standards. God's standards are still the same. And God says, I know you can't live up to my standards. You can't. But let me come into you, and me in you will enable you to live according to my standards. You know, it's amazing because, which it sounds impossible today in this. This is a time like Noah's generation. And what I mean by that, because in the early church, you can see God manifested by love. <laughs> you know, when them people got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says they did it. They went and sold all that they had that they didn't really need. And they took that wealth and laid it at the feet of the apostles. And they didn't have to have a committee to look over the shoulder of the apostles to make sure they weren't living high in the hog. Because those apostles were walking in the fear and the love of the Lord. But there was two people, a husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to get in on this good deal, so they sold some land. And, 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 and he comes, the husband comes to Peter and said, Peter... Here's this money we got from the land sale. And Peter, by the Spirit of God, says, is it all? Is it all the money? It's not that Peter wanted all the money, because it was his. And he actually told him. He said, it, when, <laughs> Ananias, it was yours. You didn't have to give it all. But Ananias said, yes, it's every penny. And you know what? Peter said, why did you, accept, why did you allow the devil to put that lie in your heart. He said, you've not lied to me. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. And he fell down dead. Whoa, what was that about? God's judgment. Oh, but God doesn't bring judgment no more. Is that right? No, that's wrong. If he brought judgment in the days of Noah's generation, in the days of Moses and Joshua and Caleb, in the days of David, he brings judgment now. And you know what? His wife comes along, and he asks her the same thing. He says, what would you do with that, uh, what'd you do with that uh, money, that you, uh, the land that you sold with that money? Oh, we gave it all. He says, you liar. He said, the people are here to take you away. Just like, and she fell down dead. And the Bible says, great fear came upon all of the inhabitants of the land. Now, if we had a couple of people fall down dead in here, they'd have the police here, wouldn't they? <laughs> man, oh, man. But, see, he said, I am the Lord, and I don't misunderstand me. God is love. And love isn't out to destroy us. Love, isn't, love is out to rescue us. Love is out to redeem us. Love is out to help us. But God ain't going to do your part. You've got to surrender. You've got to submit. You've got to yield. Now, it may seem like for a long time you can get away with what you're doing being out of the will of God. And multitudes of billions have believed that. I can keep living the way I want. I can keep doing the things I want. I can keep acting the way I want. But the day will come. It's very frightening. When you go over an invisible line drawn in the sand... And it's too late. That is so frightening. Uh, after I got born again, I went through some real hard times. And, and I backslid for a little bit. Not for very long. 
but I backslid. I didn't know any Christians. I had gone back to my own hometown after I had left Alaska being a missionary, and I, I didn't have any friends. Nobody I knew, nobody I knew knew Christ, wanted Christ. Nobody I knew, no Pentecostal churches in the community that I was in. I got the feeling sorry for myself. I began to drink a little bit here and there, carouse around a little bit. And one night, I'm sleeping, and I had this, this dream, this terrible dream. And I have it in my book, I Need God Because I'm Stupid. And in this dream, it was so real, I come out of this bar, and I was drunk. I'm out of this bar, I'm drunk. Now, I know that God loves me. You understand this. I know his love, but I know what love is. Love doesn't mean you can get away with whatever you want. And I fall down in the gutters like in the city of Chicago. I fall down in the city, and I'm laying there in my puke in the sewage, and people are walking by me, and all of a sudden, it's like, it felt like hundreds of demons. I could hear them coming. And they came rushing towards me, listen to this, and they entered into my body, and I went into convulsions. And I woke up sweating. I woke up, and I knew what God was telling me. Son, this is the invisible line. Here's the invisible line. And if you don't get back over where you belong, you're a goner. I'm telling you what, man. Right then and there, I fell on my face, and I repented. I cried out to God. I said, oh, God, I'm sorry. I repent. God, I shouldn't have allowed this to happen. I was feeling sorry for myself, and I went back in the opposite direction. I said, I'm coming, Daddy. I'm coming, Daddy. But that was the fear of the Lord. That's why Paul said to the Philippians, as you, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the Spirit of God is at work in me to do the will and the good pleasure of God. And how long do I think I can get away with bucking and grieving the Holy Spirit. Well, you might get away with it for years. Some people, I don't know why, they don't get away with it very long. I don't understand it. It's like, boom, they're gone. And other people, it seems like they can live their whole life that way. And they finally, I tell you, I can't tell you how many backslidden Christians and believers I know. Whew, backslidden. Back, have no desire for God. No hunger for God. They want to talk about, don't come to the house of God. They don't pray. They don't read their Bible. They don't seek God's face. They don't, they don't hide the word in their heart. And, and somehow the devil has deceived them into thinking, I'm okay, I'm all right. God loves me. But it's not the kind of love, see, it's God's long suffering and God's goodness that they're still alive. But the day will come when they don't know it, and they will cross that invisible line. You know, one time, his, the disciples of Jesus was talking to him about the, the, the men, the Galileans, who, who Herod had killed, or was it Pilate, and had mixed their blood with worshiping of demons. And, and then the Tower of Shalom had fallen on a bunch of men, and Jesus said a very frightening thing to his disciples. He said this to his disciples. He said, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. I don't know. I can't tell you how many times when God told me somebody was going to die. And one day I was up here preaching, and a husband and wife were sitting over here. I knew the wife for years. We had led her to the Lord and to the baptism, and then she had gotten married to this guy. This, he was probably in his early 40s. He seemed completely healthy. Nothing wrong with him. But I perceived in my heart by the Holy Ghost things were right. And I prophesied. I said, uh, <clears throat> there's a brother here about this age. Um, uh, your time is running out. You don't have much time left. And if you don't repent and really go after God. And I knew who it was. I said, you're going to fall over dead. Now, in the natural, there should have been no reason for him to fall over dead. 
Well, he didn't repent. He didn't get on fire for God. He didn't, he didn't get back up in the saddle, you might say, and go for Jesus. Oh, my heart's heavy now. Judgment's coming. I hate to tell you this. So he didn't go after God. And one day I got a phone call from his wife. My husband died. My husband died. I said, what? How'd he die? Well, he had blood clots in his leg. I said, okay. And he had a vibrating machine. This really happened. A vibrating machine, yeah. And he said he would use it on his legs and his body. He said, Pastor Mike, he told me one day. See, God tried to warn him. Honey, I don't know why, but I just, in my heart, I feel like I'm not supposed to use that vibrator machine anymore. That's what he told her. I'm not supposed to use it no more. And so she said, okay, well then listen to God. Well, was about a half an hour later, she heard a thud, something fall down. She went into the bedroom, and for some reason, he took that vibrating machine because his legs were hurt and vibrated his leg, loosened a blood clot, went right to his heart, and he was gone. Now, I'll tell you the truth. I knew people who were a lot worse sinners than him. But he was lukewarm. I'm not judging his heart. By their fruits, he was lukewarm. And he didn't heed the warning. And he fell over dead. Well, why would a God of love do that? Well, God didn't kill him. See, what happened is we opened the door for the devil, just like Job did, because Job had lack of knowledge. Job... He didn't understand God's love either. He really didn't even understand God. Now, he, 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 he was a man of righteousness, but he, he really, he was blaming God for th things that God didn't do. He didn't know the reality of the devil. His children were full of sin. And so every day he's offering sacrifices to God. I studied the book of Job very carefully. I studied every word that Job spoke, compared it to what Jesus taught, and I discovered there is 21 things that Job believed which were lies. They were lies. He didn't have Jesus, though. We've got Jesus, man. Don't believe the lie. You can live any way you want and go to heaven. Everything's going to be okay. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and nothing's going to be wrong. That your marriage will always be good. Your kids will always be stable. Your finances will always be there. Your health will always be, uh, you know, you'll always be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. That's a lie. You know, the Bible says redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, we'll get ready to close here. But the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, actually chapter 13, you really need to do a study of that. What you should do is, you know, you, you need to go through there with a highlighter. And you need to highlight the word love. Agape, 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 agape. And you would be amazed at what God says. God says, my father, my father loves you because you love me. My father loves them that love me. This, this divine love. God loves everybody, understand that. But there is a different level of love. It's not respect to our people. It's like Jesus had uh, three disciples that were closer to him than the 12, and then he had 70. Now, I really believe our position with Christ is determined by our love for him. I'll give you an example. Uh, Mary Magdalene, who Jesus cast seven devils out of. And uh, the Spirit of God led her. And she took a box, an alabaster box, which was her inheritance, worth a whole year's worth of wages, went into the Pharisee's house, broke it open, poured it over his head, fell to her face, weeping on his feet, takes her hair and wipes her fe his feet, kissing his feet. The Pharisees are really upset because all they knew is she had been a woman of ill repute. She had been. No, she ain't no more. 
And they'd be in their heart, in their hearts, they're criticizing Jesus. And Jesus said, well, let's talk about this, what's happening here. He said, you know, when I came to my house, it's traditional for you to wash the feet. You didn't even wash my feet. He said, you didn't anoint my head with oil. You know, they lived in an environment that was extremely hot, and so they would provide olive oil to, to, for your dry skin. They didn't give them oil. He said, but since I've been here, this woman has not ceased to wipe my feet with her tears, to anoint me with this expensive. Because they were saying, man, that thing. And even his disciples said, well, that could have been sold and been given to the poor. But she was anointing him for burial. And he said this, he said, he that is forgiven a much, loveth much. Well, Pastor Mike, you just love God more because you're forgiven of more. No, don't you understand? We all have sinned. See, the, 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 the things I did before I got born again, yeah, they were going to send me to hell. But your lukewarmness will send you to hell just as much as my sinfulness did. I'm going to say it again. The things I did would have sent me to hell, but lukewarmness will send you to the same place that my passion for sin was. And that's why it's more deceitful. That's why Jesus said, I would rather have you cold or hot. You get into this place where everything's hunkadory. I don't know why I'm speaking this by the Spirit of God. I wasn't even planning on preaching this message. I think it's a divine warning. You get into this place where you think, I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm not as bad as the next guy. Well, I'm telling you, that man who fell over dead when that blood clot happened, he, was, he wasn't a bad guy. But his wife would come to me, he just wouldn't get on fire for Jesus. He, he just wouldn't seek God. He just wouldn't, he wouldn't get a hold of the word. Just nothing, no spark, just, I'm coming to church, honey. I hope that makes you happy. And he fell over dead. God warned him. So God's ways are much higher than our ways. So you can read John, the Gospel of John, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. You can also take a hold of First John, the epistle of 1 John, and highlight every time it talks about love. If you really want to understand love, and this is love, and this is love, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Pastor Mike, why would you preach such a message? Because I love you. Not just those who are here in the sanctuary, but those who are watching by modern technology. I love you. You know, I, uh, many, many times I've shed a lot of tears because I'm concerned about myself and my family and others. Oh, God, do we, do we really love you? Are we really following you? Are we really serving you? Are we really, you said, you said, love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind. Love me. This isn't religion. This is passion. This is obsession. This is possession. This is being consumed because God is a consuming fire. You know, it's just like my wife. Uh, I say this because it's true. I, I won't share her with anybody. She's my wife. And God is a jealous God. God wants all of us. And he made us for his pleasure, for his own glory. Does he not? Didn't God, didn't Christ give everything? Every, and then he was made sin? He took our sicknesses and our diseases, and I say this to Mike Yeager constantly, Mike, Mike, Jesus deserves every part of you, every thought, every desire. And you may think that sounds boring, but when you get, when you get to that place, it is so exciting. <laughs> I mean, wonderful things happen. Fights and battles and challenges, and you win them. It's like you're getting in a boxing ring every day, and you have, you're duking it out with the devil. You might get punched and kicked and knocked down, but you get back up, and, and, and then you finally lay a knockout blow to the devil's chin. Boom! And they give him the countdown, and, and he can't get back up. And they hold up your arms, and they said, champion, here's the champion. And the Bible says, we're more than conquerors. We're champions through Christ. We're not supposed to be in that boxing ring of life, and the devil's knocking us and kicking us, and we're down for the count. 
Well, I'm on the ground. Well, get up. I messed up, Pastor Mike. Well, okay. You think that's abnormal? Get back up, right? Get back up. Say that. I mean, we need to get back up, get back up, get back. Like, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. <laughs> get back up, get back up. Get. Say that, everybody. Get back up. Come on, I want to hear you, Stephen. Get back up. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Danny and Catherine, get back up. I don't know if I heard them. So, get back up. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13 in the Amplified before we close. This is understanding God. Um, but, and the Amplified is really powerful. Um, maybe I can, I'll just read it. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels but have not love. Uh, and it says, the spiritual devotion such as inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, that is the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose and understanding all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge, and I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, that's God's love inside of me, operating through me. I'll add some things here. I am nothing. Listen to this. I am a useless nobody. I don't care if you have faith to move mountains. Speak in tongues of men and of angels. Understand all mysteries and knowledge. If, I, if I'm not walking in God's love, if I don't love God and love people, I'm useless. Even if I dole out or give out all that I have to the poor in providing food, shelter, every needed thing. And if I surrender my body or I give my body to be burned in order that I may glory, but I have not God's love in me operating through me, I'm nothing. And now it's going to give us the description of God. This is the description of God. God, this is God. God endures long, or love endures long. Well, you don't know how much I put up with. God endures long. God is patient and kind. Well, if I'm right operating in God's love, I'm going to be patient and kind. You know, today there's a lot of impatience going on. Just impatient, impatient. And I find it trying to operate in me. You get an account, checkout line, and the people or the person are, and is and they're just like, they're in slow motion. I mean, and your mind is saying, come on, man. How, how much does it take to take that can of beans and go, and they go three times. And then they, oh, I put it in the, I put it in the machine twice. I've got to, now you've got to call up, and you've got to get the manager to come over, and they've got to take, I mean, really, man, it's like, I mean, there's been times I've been in the checkout line with one person in front of me, and it's like I'm in a twilight zone. It's like, do, 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 do. you know, like, God, is this happening? And God said, patience, patience, long-suffering. <laughs> and I go, oh, God, and I start praying. Now, you might think I'm praying for the person in front of me, but I'm praying for me. Oh, God, God, I need to be patient. And it says, um, it's kind, not snappy, not ugly, not mean. Love never is envious or boils over with jealousy. I'm not getting upset because somebody's more blessed than I am. Getting upset because you've had experiences with God and I haven't. Or whatever, what kind of jealousy there is. Or pastor doesn't give me as much time as he does that person. Just stupid stuff, say stupid stuff. <laughs> is not boastful or vainglorious. For in other words, we boast on Jesus and say, ain't I something, man? I'm the cream of the crop. Look what God does for me. Sometimes when people share testimonies, we got to really use wisdom and try to and make sure we're not trying to make, you know, I've heard people get healed and somebody said, praise the Lord, I prayed for you. Well, hold on, we were all praying for them. Oh, you mean to think you, it was your prayers? No, it was God who did it. 
You might lay your hands on a person and God will give them a new liver. I've seen that. God will give them a new heart. But guess what? It was in spite of me. <laughs> Matter of fact, a lot of times when I've seen God do miracles, I go, wow, God. I know that wasn't me. Um, I had a friend of mine. He said, and I don't know how true it is. I, don't, I would hope he wouldn't be lying. No, he couldn't have been lying because he, he said there was thousands of, uh, of people there. And uh, uh, he said he was out in South America and he was preaching, I think it was in Brazil. And there's this big church and they're at pastor's conference. All of a sudden, there's a bunch of commotion in the back. And the, these family members come running in. And, and there's a, a person wrapped up in rags, all bloody and dead. And, and they brought him up front. It was uh, a, a man's wife. And. Somehow she, I don't know, she got ran over by a trolley or something and got basically torn in half. And, and they said, pray, brother, pray. He was the American, you know, pray. He said, Mike, he said, I laid hands on that woman with absolutely no faith whatsoever. He said, I was just doing it to appease them. So when I laid my hands, I rebuked the spirit of death. I commanded her to be healed. I'm telling you, Mike, I wasn't believing one iota. All of a sudden, skin color came back to the parts of her skin you could see. Next thing she was breathing, and she was sitting up, and the whole place exploded. And, and people thought it was me. But he said, I wasn't even really believing. Isn't God wonderful? <laughs> God raised her from the dead, knitted her. When they pulled back the rags, there was no wounds on her body. God did it. Isn't he wonderful? And he says, uh, it's not boastful or vainglorious. does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited. God is none of these things. God's not conceited. He's not arrogant. He's not inflated with pride. It's, it's not rude. God is never rude does not act on becomingly love, God's love that is in us because it's God, does not insist on its own rights. What does that mean? It's, it's not self-centered, self-loving, self-serving. It's hard for us to understand. But even though we were made for God's pleasure, here's the thing. God's never done anything out of a selfish motive. That's that's why it says, if, if God did not spare his own son, then how will he not with, with us also freely give us all things? There is, not, there is not an atom of selfishness in God. So when we see him, we'll be like him, and there will not even be a spark, a speck of selfishness in us throughout eternity. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Right now, we've got to deal with that selfish part of our lives. The old man that wants to have its way, get the biggest piece of apple pie and not share it, <laughs> hide the steak, <laughs> shove it in your mouth when no one's around, right? Its own way, it, for it is not self-seeking. Listen, it's not touchy. You don't have to walk on thin ice around people who are walking God's love. You won't have to be afraid of offending them. I got to watch what I say because they'll get offended and they'll never come back. Oh, I, I got to watch what I say because they'll blow up on me. I got to watch. Oh, it says it's not fretful, doesn't fearful because uh, perfect love casteth out fear. It's not resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. You don't keep track of, I won't forget what you did to me. No, it doesn't. It gives it to God. It pays no attention to suffered wrong. For other words, when you do me wrong, it's not like I'm going to meditate on it and think of I need to give it to God. I need, God forget, if God took, 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 took kept track of everything I did wrong in the sense that now, God knows everything. I understand this, but when I repent of it, it it's, see, the truth of the matter is if you don't repent, that, that I don't know how many ever uh, read Pilgrim's Progress. And, and Pil in, in the beginning, Christian, who was not a, yet a Christian, who he got saved, he had this bag of rocks on his back, and it was getting bigger and bigger. That's your load of sin. You carry it with you until you finally fall at the cross and you repent, and then it rolls off of your back down the hill of Calvary. Can you say praise the Lord? 
uh, it says it does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevails. Love bears up under anything, say anything, and everything that comes along. Love can deal with it. Don't ever say, I can't deal with this. No, in the name of Jesus, I'll deal with this. I, I, and I'm just being honest with you. I, first of all, I never wanted to be a pastor. Whew, hated the thought of being a pastor. Put it engraved on my first Bible that was the first nice Bible I ever got and had it engraved with gold lettering, Evangelist Michael Yeager. Next thing you know, I'm pastoring, 1977. And I basically have never stopped. Didn't want to be a pastor. And, 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 and so there's a lot of things I've had to do I didn't want to do. I had no desire to do it. But Paul said, Less, he said it, it, I, I've got to preach the gospel. I have no choice. And don't misunderstand me. It's such a privilege to declare the word of God. But the pressure, it's not really the preaching of the word. Really, this is the easy part. It's all the rest of it that comes along. The bills, the maintenance, the people, the gossip, the backbiting, the strife, uh, the, 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 all the natural. You know, I was thinking this. The scripture says that I, an unfaithful man in the time of trouble is like a broken jaw and a foot out of joint. For in other words... When, when, when all of a sudden the fat hits the fire, people just run for the hills. In other words, when things are getting bad, people run from you. Instead of rolling up the sleeve and saying, come on, Pastor Mike, we're going to believe with you. We're going to trust with you. We're going all the way with you. Matter of fact, you discover when all hell breaks loose, a lot of the people who you thought were with you actually... Join the crowd who want to stone you. Isn't that what happened on Jesus? Listen, when he was standing before Pilate, you don't think, and they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Cru you don't think that a lot of the people he healed and delivered were standing in that crowd? Yeah, they were. But he never got bitter. <laughs> he got up there on Calvary. He's nailed to the tree, been beat to where you can't tell he's a man, ripped the beard out of his face, got the crown of thorns on his head. They're mocking him and laughing him. And he looks up to heaven and love speaks. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Whew. That's where God's trying to take us. God's trying to take us to that place where we can't be offended. No matter what people do to us, we'll never be hateful, never be nasty, never. Are we there yet? <laughs> God help us. And it says, it does not rejoice. It, it says, love bears all th under all things and everything that comes is ever ready to believe the best of every person. It hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. Can you say amen? Amen.